Hi everyone, I'm Mr. Lee here. In this video, we are gonna go over rotational impulse. All right, let's begin. So in the last video, we went over the conservation of rotational momentum. We said that the uh, momentum initial is equal to the rotational momentum final. And from there, uh, we broke it down even more. We said that I initial omega initial is equal to I final omega final. From there, we were able to see how uh, when you're changing the different variables uh, within each of these equations, how it affects a rotating object. Okay, so this is when there are no outside torques. But what I want to do now is because we're looking at impulse or rotational impulse, I want to see a scenario where there is a outside force. So let's begin. Now, the best way to approach this is, of course, to take a look at the scenario from a linear point of view, uh, because it's something that we're pretty pretty used to, right? So we can state that the uh, the impulse, which is J, is equal to the change in momentum, which is also equal to the force times the change in time. So we have this uh, translational version of impulse, okay? And so. This is like, for example, if we had a, a object that's like sliding on the floor, okay, and it's moving and it's moving and moving, according to Newton's laws, it'll keep on moving uh, forward unless there is a outside force. And that outside force could be like the force of friction to slow it down, which would change its momentum. Or if like someone were to exert a force on it and that would change the, the momentum of the moving object. So the same holds true for anything that is rotating. So for example, if we were to get like a top a spinning top, um, or let's say we were to get, I don't know, like a pencil, and we were to rotate that pencil or top in space. So I'm gonna do the pencil idea. So we, if we were to get a pencil, right, and then we're floating in a space station and we were to rotate it, okay? So if we were to rotate it, this top would be spinning around. And because we have a object that is rotating, we can say that this object would have a rotational uh, momentum. Now this is what we know, especially in space, because like it's just floating there. There are no outside forces that is going to be affecting this object. Therefore, this object will continually, continually rotate. And we know this to be true because in one of the previous videos, we went over the conservation of energy. So this is a kind of like a little sidebar that we're about to do. Okay, so we know this is true because this also works for celestial objects. Now, if you remember, we had a, um, an example where we had the planet and we had a moon that orbits the planet, right? That's not really a good orbit. Let me try a little bit better. All right, so we have a planet and we have a orbit. So that bigger circle will be the orbit of this planet, um, this moon, excuse me, and we'll call that moon B. Right, so we have planet A, we have moon B, and it's orbiting, um, moon B will be orbiting around this ellipses, okay, or this weird like circle. Now, we discussed that uh, there's gonna be two locations. Uh, there's location one, and we can say that right here will be location two. And so when we were approaching this, uh, this scenario with the, the lens of energy, we said that at location one, the gravitational potential energy is so big that the moon will have a lower kinetic energy, right? It's not moving fast versus when it's at position two, where we can say the gravitational potential energy is really, really low. Therefore, the kinetic energy is super high. Now, if we were to use the idea of momentum, both scenarios will still apply. So from the middle of the planet A all the way out to where planet or where the moon is at position one, we can say that's R, right? And that R is pretty big. And we said that the R is pretty big because of right there, the gravitational potential energy is really big. And so if we were taking a look at this equation, uh, momentum is equal to I omega, in this case, because the R is so big, if you want to remind yourselves, I is uh, mR squared omega. Remember, that's not the official equation, but just a way that we can look at I. When we increased R, the rotational inertia okay, for the moon at position one, it decreased. So I decreased. Oh, excuse me, it increased. 
um, because the the r is so big now because i increase that means the omega decrease and we discussed that in the previous video um, where we're talking about the relationship of i and omega right and if omega decreases that means the kinetic energy goes down and when the the moon like orbits around and it goes to position two that's when the i decreases because the radius is small therefore the rotational velocity increases and so this idea of this spinning object uh, works for if you were to get a pencil and you were to rotate in the moon or, or in space, right? It'll keep on rotating around and around and around. And it also applies to space objects like planets and moons. It just uh, it just keeps on rotating because it has to. Not only do you have to follow the laws of conservation of momentum, so do the objects that are floating out there in space. Giant planets and giant moons. It's really cool. All right, so back to this uh, spinning pencil. So we have a pencil and we rotate it. It's rotating around and around and around and around. And it will continually spin for how long? For infinity, unless there is a outside torque. And that outside torque can be just an astronaut grabbing that rotating pencil or if that pencil were to hit a wall, right? Something um, that will cause it to change its rotating momentum. So how do we describe this? Well, if we were to take a look at this highlighted equation above, we can use that to really describe um, how we can look at a, uh, a change in momentum. We can say that the change in rotational momentum is caused by a outside torque acting on the system over a period of time. And so this right here is the the change in rotational momentum equation. That's a highlighted one, it's very important. All right, now, um, what I want to do next is to take a look at what this could be, okay? Because it's easy to imagine if we have an object that is, uh, let's say in this case up here, right? If we have an object that's moving to the right, it's gonna keep on moving to the right unless there's an outside force. So let's say we have a foot, right? That's my foot, and this foot kicks the object while it's moving to the right. That must mean that your initial momentum will be less than your final momentum. Okay, so the object's moving as a momentum, and then poof, you punt it, you kick it. And so when we kick it, the object's momentum increases because uh, we exerted a force in the same direction. So force is in the same direction as the velocity, right? So if the velocity and the force are in the same direction, we made the object uh, speed up. And that's because the acceleration in F equals MA Right, we exerted a force, therefore we uh, made the object accelerate along the same velocity of the object. So the, the two sides, they, they added up, right? And so the object will speed up. And so the opposite is also true, right? If this object was moving to the right, but instead of kicking it to the right while it's moving to the right, like if we, if we like, you know, kind of like nudge it to the left, the momentum in that case would be uh, it'll be greater initially because we slowed it down and that's because the force is in the opposite direction of the velocity it slows down okay uh, but in the first situation it would this is a speed up now I want to focus on this because of um, how we can look at rotating objects. So I'm going to go over two ideas here. I'm going to go over the conceptual idea first um, because that really helps you know really solidify all of this um, and it, it makes the most sense but I'm going to show you a, a new technique. So if we have an object that is rotating such as this pencil right so we have a pencil I'm not going to draw the pencil I'm just going to draw it as a line but this pencil is rotating clockwise oh, excuse me this is counterclockwise. So this pencil is rotating counterclockwise and when it is at that position if you were to just nudge it, boop, right? You were to go boop, right? So this is we're in space and we kind of nudge it as it's rotating, okay? At that location right there, um, we are going to make it spin faster. Now this is where all the units kind of like combine into one. So when we poke our finger, right, at the rotating, uh, rotating pencil, we are exerting a force and this force is at a radius R away, and we just learned last week that the if you have force times the radius, okay, we have a torque. What we just did when we poked this pencil that is rotating, we exerted a net torque. Now we got to think about this conceptually, right? If this object is rotating counterclockwise, and when the pencil is at this position right here, okay, and we poke it, will it spin faster or slower? So hopefully you came to the idea that it'll spin faster. 
Okay, and this is like um, if we were trying to describe the object that's moving side to side, that's you kicking it in the same direction that it was moving. So basically, we're exerting a torque in the same direction that it is spinning. So it'll spin faster. Okay, so this is um, a big idea. And it's easier to um, bring this conceptually. Okay, now the other way or the other scenario, right, is if this is spinning counterclockwise um, and we push it against. We push it against its motion, right? So that's its rotating axis right there, force, right? So it's rotating counterclockwise, and you you poke the pencil, boop, right, ever so slightly as it's rotating. So when you do that, you're exerting a net torque, and it then will it'll spin slower, spin slower. And this is because rotating objects have a direction of spin. Okay, um, and that direction of spin, clockwise and counterclockwise, it's much like moving left or right. Those directions actually matter. Okay, so consider that and think about that while we are, while you are looking at the different problems in the scenarios. Right, what causes a faster spin? Well, if the torque is in the same direction, so we can say here uh, the torque was, uh, what do we say, counterclockwise? Okay, and that's because we can say. Uh, it spun faster because the object itself was spinning counterclockwise. And here we can say that the torque was clockwise, and that's because the object not only did it spin slower, but the object itself was spinning counterclockwise. So the two directions went against each other. All right, awesome. Now, the final thing that I want to bring up are the different kinds of graphs you might see. So we know that if we were to take a look at that equation up there, we know that uh, that delta L is equal to torque times the change in time. So remember, uh, if you have a area under the curve, your two variables, your x and your y variables, okay, uh, they are being multiplied. And so in this case, if we were to take a look at this equation right here, uh, if your x and your y variables, your, your x variable would be time uh, versus torque, right? Sometimes you might see me write it like this. So that's not a minus sign. That's just me writing versus time versus torque, right? If you have a time versus torque, the area on the curve will tell you how much the momentum has changed. So if I were to do a quick little sketch, this will be time and this will be torque, right? And if we were to have, I don't know, let's do... Let's do something like this, right? So this shaded region right there, okay, that shaded region right there, that will give you, this is the area under the curve, and the area under the curve is the change in momentum, okay, whatever that is. Um, and so you could use that and you can plug into the formula to really see exactly what goes on there. Now the other way, oh, by the way, so for something like this, um, this gives us a positive area under the curve, right? And so if we were to continue this line, Right, and then we were to say, I don't know, something like this. It kind of drops down like this. So it goes up, 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 and then all of a sudden, the torque changes to something like that. That drop would be a. I'll do this in blue. Right, this area under the curve, right there. This would be the change in rotation momentum, and this will be a negative change in rotation momentum. So if we have an object that is spinning, let's say clockwise, and we say clockwise is positive um, during this portion, right? If we were to say clockwise is positive, this, uh, this rotating object is getting faster and faster and faster. And then during this portion, if the object is rotating clockwise, and we say clockwise is positive during this portion, the object will be getting slower and slower and slower. Okay, so that's how we can read it. Now, the next thing that we can look at is the slope. The slope. Now, if you remember, slope is a rise over run. Um, so that's y divided by x. So the variables are dividing. These are skills that we have been working with throughout the entire physics course. Okay, how to look at area in the curve and how to look at slope. And so if your variables are being divided, um, that is the slope. Right, and so in the case of we, if we were to take a look at this equation right now, there's nothing that's being divided. But what we can do is we can rearrange this equation so that we have some sort of division. So, for example, if we have delta L divided by the time, okay, that gives us the torque. So if I were to create a, um, this will be time and this will be momentum, right? Time versus momentum, this slope would be torque. 
okay? The slope will be torque, right? So this is one way of arranging it. Another way of arranging it, instead of delta L divided by time, we can do delta L divided by torque, okay? In that case, we will get delta T. And so if I were to create a graph for that, uh, let's see, we'll say this is delta L and this is torque, right? The slope, um, I'll just do that, right? So this slope, would give us the change in time, right? So this is just the techniques that we've been developing throughout our entire physics careers. All right, so there's a couple of things that we looked at. We looked at, um, we further investigated how this conservation of momentum and this conservation of uh, energy, how they relate once again, okay? Um, and we also took a look at uh, the impulse equations all right, and then um, we went from the translational impulse to rotational impulse, all right? And then we, we discussed how uh, the, the direction of the spin um, is like a direction of a moving object. That's very important right there. And that'll definitely come back. And we also took a look at how we can look at the different graphs that you might come across, okay? How the different graphs um, can be read by using this equation. Once again, I'll highlight this that is the equation that we're working with all right now we're just reinforcing our skills of slope versus area under the curve okay so the very last thing i want to do is i want to make our way back here uh, with the idea of conservation of momentum um, and the conservation of energy and that's because uh, the conservation of momentum and energy they go hand in hand but this is a, a great way to review the basic ideas so we discussed that for energy and momentum okay so this is what you need to know and this is true for rotational so rotational energy versus rotational momentum okay always always conserved gosh get that tattooed somewhere right if you're like, but I don't want tattoos, just write it down on your face. Just write there, always conserved. Momentum, always conserved. Okay, momentum cannot change unless there's an outside torque. Okay, that's a big part. Rotational energy. So this is where things get a little bit uh, different. If you have um, a inelastic situation, okay, and this is where you have two rotating objects and they get stuck to each other, right? You have object, 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 and they, they, they hit each other and they stick and they rotate, okay? Uh, in an elastic situation, no energy, or excuse me, energy not conserved. So what that means is that the kinetic energy rotational initial does not equal to the kinetic energy rotational final, okay? Um, but if you have a elastic, a perfectly elastic, perfectly elastic situation, energy is conserved. All right, so these, these rules still apply. All right, well, that's it for me. Um, the next video, our final video for this entire unit, uh, we'll be taking a look at the, probably one of the more complicated ideas behind um, the whole rotational unit. I'll see you then. Bye-bye.